Iran has launched an unprecedented offensive from its own territory against Israel. What will happen now? What should happen now? To answer these and other questions, we have the incredible privilege of having these eye-opening discussions between Machon Chilo's Rabbi David Bar Chaim and Jewish hero Yonathan Pollard. Welcome, Yonathan. Thank you. Glad to be here. Rabbi Bar Chaim. <clears throat> Shalom. Uh, Yonathan, my friend, and Hello. welcome to all our listeners and viewers. I might mention at the outset that due to a, uh, a recent trip that you had to undertake overseas, and therefore uh, a small hiatus in our regular uh, conversations, we, we were inundated with uh, many SOS calls. Where where are these conversations? Well, why are you not uh, posting more more information and more uh, insights? We we need we need to hear more from from Jonathan Pollard. So we're happy that we're able to do this again starting today. And uh, let us begin at the beginning. We all know that this past uh, very early Sunday morning is real time. The night between. Saturday night and Sunday, Saturday and Sunday, uh, Iran, for the first time uh, in living memory, attacked uh, Israel with uh, well over 300 uh, missiles, cruise missiles, in, and even ballistic missiles and, and drones. Various interpretations have been offered with, with regards to the outcome. The outcome was that 99%, uh, I believe that's an accurate figure, nine, literally 99% of, of those uh, drones and missiles, <clears throat> excuse me, were intercepted and neutralized. Very, very uh, minor damage uh, occurred in one or two sites uh, here in Israel. But beyond that, essentially, uh, there was no uh, no effective uh, destruction or or devastation in Israel. Was this the result, as some claim, as the army essentially is? This is the the claim being promoted by the IDF and its spokesman. This was a a brilliant feat of of Israeli and uh, Israeli technology, American technology. Um, being able to neutralize this threat, and therefore it's a great victory for Israel. On the other hand, another interpretation that I've heard is that uh, this was a deliberately non-sophisticated, shall we say, unsophisticated, and uh, it was never planned to be a very successful attack. It was more of a warning, more of a taste of things to come, more of a... Uh, test run, but the uh, the real deal, if and when it comes, would be very, would be, the outcome would be very different. Uh, so what is, what is your view, first of all, with regards to those very, very uh, diametrically opposed interpretations? First of all, had the Iranians really intended to hurt us badly, the attack out of Iran would have been far greater and it would have been conducted in cooperation or simultaneously rather with Hezbollah. The result of an attack like that would have been devastating because they simply, the combination of the Iranian arsenal and the Hezbollah, Hezbollah's arsenal would have saturated our ballistic missile defense systems. And uh, we probably would have lost most of our power stations, our water purification centers, our desalination centers, and many of our hospitals. Um, we simply do not have the capacity to withstand uh, that kind of overwhelming force. So what are we looking at? Let us go back in time four years to the aftermath of America's assassination 
of uh, Qasem Soleimani when the uh, Iranians threatened blood revenge and they raised red flags and uh, symbolizing the fact that uh, according to Shiite custom, blood must flow in uh, retaliation for what happened. Well, there was an attack, an Iranian attack on an American base in Iraq called Ain al-Assad. And it was hit by a volley of ballistic missiles, some of which missed the camp and others which hit with pinpoint accuracy various facilities in, in the camp. It has now been established beyond any shred of doubt that this was uh, a pre-coordinated strike with the United States. Donald Trump subsequently acknowledged as much. The commander of the base itself acknowledged as much. And the regional US commander acknowledged as much. There was an effort by both the Iranians and the Americans to allow Iran to save face but not to do so much damage that it would require an American response to that. And what happened was just that. There were no deaths that were caused by this rocket strike, simply because we knew when the strike was going to occur and what it was going to be composed of. So that everybody basically at the base was in uh, protective uh, facilities at the time bomb shelters, if you will. Now, just parenthetically, there were a lot of uh, American service members that suffered from traumatic brain injury, TBI, after that strike. So to say that there were no casualties might be correct insofar as nobody died, but there were many, many service members that had um, some really severe cases of traumatic brain injury from the concussion. So that was in 2020. What we have seen now, I believe, based on everything that I've, I've read from all sources and from conversations I've had with um, friends of mine in the Israeli intelligence and uh, service Amman, and in uh, the operational wings of the army as well, that what we had was what, we, what they're calling Ain al-Assad number two, we had the same thing. Now, in the run-up to this strike that we just uh, was able to uh, deflect or defeat, if you will, the Iranians amped up their threats, just as they did with the original Ain al-Assad. Um, the United States got involved through back channels to work with the Iranians to establish some kind of face-saving measure for them to hit us, but not hit us in a way that would ignite the Middle East. So what my sources told me the Americans promised uh, Iran was that if no American assets were targeted, and the strike itself was comparatively limited, and the date was known, and the attacking force was known, and their avenues of approach were known, that the Americans in response would guarantee that Israel would not retaliate for the strike. Now, there is some controversy that I've run into as to whether or not Israel was a party to this. But those of uh, my contacts that I, I have come to trust in terms of their credibility have been very clear that the government knew about this deal from top to bottom. They all knew about it. What I find incredible are two things. Number one, if a country knows the date, the time, and the nature of an attack and does nothing preemptively to stop it, 
I consider that unethical in the extreme. I consider that a violation of the bond between an elected government and its citizens. It's unacceptable. Two, given the fact that the Israeli government knew very well about this face-saving arrangement between Iran and the United States, why in the world did they scare the heck out of everybody in Israel? I was, as you suggested, or you, you, you ind indicated, I was out of the country at the time. I wasn't on vacation. I was on an official mission for the World Zionist Organization in France. And I was being inundated by calls from friends. They were hysterical. How can we, can we get our children to join you? Can, can we get, get our, our, our older children part of your delegation? What, what can we do? And it was horrible to listen to all of this because I knew instinctively there was something wrong. And for the government, not to strike first in a preemptive measure is one problem. But to allow the whole country to be traumatized before the strike, when they knew the strike was not going to be, you know, Armageddon, I think go, it was criminal. It wasn't just immoral. It was criminal, plain and simple. But we've known for a long time that neither the government nor the high army high command is really that concerned with um, protecting the Israeli people. They just want to make sure, as they did with Iron Dome originally, that enough of our defenses can be successful that we wouldn't be required to do any retaliatory action. That's That was a, kind of the implied understanding of Iron Dome. And it's proven to be a disaster. Okay, so we have this situation now, and the Iranians, were the, the strike was defeated, more or less. And now the issue is one of retaliation. And everybody's going through this prearranged process of pretending to be in favor of, of some type of retaliation, of not wanting to uh, amp up our retaliation to the point where it becomes a general conflagration in the Middle East. All these people are acting their roles. And the most interesting ones were, well, as usual, Benny Gantz and Gaddy Eisenkot. They immediately had their people disseminate uh, a story that they were and still are in favor of a large retaliatory strike. They're playing their role because they know very well that the chances of that happening are slim to none. And the BB, the fact that BB went out with a statement saying that nothing of the sort, you know, they never called for this is something that, um, well, people aren't listening to. All they're listening to is what the Americans wanted Gantz and Eisenkot to say, that they're in favor of retaliation. Now, uh, Bitsalo Smutrich and uh, Itamar Ben Gavir also came out with statements arguing for a, retali a robust retaliation. And they had absolutely no fore forewarning of what this, um, this pre coordination between the Americans and the Iranians was about. They weren't privy to this. So the only ones that are genuinely making the case for retaliation. Are the are Itamar Ben Gvir and Bitsala Smutich, but it doesn't matter what they have to say in this matter. We should remember that. So the Americans, almost from the start, from the minute the the war the this this attack was over, the Americans have been hammering, drumming, just absolutely overwhelming us openly with the fact that we should not retaliate. And if we do retaliate in any way, shape or form, we're on our own. Well, gee, thanks. I mean, that's not exactly how allies should work unless we have this pre-arranged, pre-coordinated agreement between the Iranians and the Americans. And that's why the Americans, by the way, are so insistent that we not retaliate in any way, shape or form. 
because they promised that to the Iranians. So we have to understand that sometimes there are multiple realities. There's the reality of this strike and what it suggested and why the Iranians did it, mostly to save face. And you look at how they did it in coordination, apparently with the Americans, where it was designed to save their face, but not uh, prompt an overwhelming Israeli response. Okay. And you have the actual reality of what happened, which looks like a miracle. And uh, our systems, our defensive systems were quite good. Uh, they were excellent. And uh, there is some feeling that they would not have been that excellent had not the Jordanians and the Americans in particular uh, shot down as many cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and drones as they did. That's That we have to be very careful about. Okay, we have to be very careful drawing that conclusion. Our, because given the nature of the Iranian attack, it's my contention that our defenses could have handled it without any involvement of the Americans or the Jordanians for that matter. But we don't have proof of that. We don't know. It's just my assumption uh, based on what we were able, subsequently able to accomplish against the, the uh, enemy systems that attacked 